another edition of the Caregiver's Voice. Today, we have a special guest, and he is a caregiver for his U.S. Army and Vietnam era veteran father who lives with frontal temporal lobe dementia. Today's guest has been posting YouTube videos for reminding me of another son caregiver, Joey, who recently lost his mom to Lewy body dementia. We featured Joey here last year at the Caregiver's Voice after he launched Molly's Movement to raise awareness of his mother's dementia. So let's not take any more time. Let's meet our special guest today, Ken Keen Jr., or as many are coming to know him, Tough Kenamon's son. Welcome, Ken. Wow. Brenda, that was uh, wonderful. Uh, that's a beautiful invitation right there. And thank you for that introduction. That was uh, perfect. <laughs> and Tough Kenamon, tell me, Ken, how did your father get this name? Um, normally, I guess people are given a name. Well, he gave this name to himself. And uh, it all started, I think, about almost 10 years ago, maybe, maybe 12 years ago. But he was working for uh, Philadelphia Electric, and he used to visit a location in Chester County, Pennsylvania. And the name of this place was Tough Kenamon. Um, well, he was going there quite often. And I think how the story kind of fabricated was he was out at Tough Kenamon, Pennsylvania, and he was waiting on some contractors. Well, these contractors were running a little late, and I think my dad was sitting in front of this big Tough Kenamon sign for a number of hours. And he was getting a little angry, and he was getting impatient and annoyed. And I think he started just like kind of looking at the sign and, and coming up with you know, this make-believe story that when he confronts these contractors, he's going to give them an earful. He's going to put them in their place. And looking at the sign, I don't know if maybe inspired him or what, whatever it had done, but the sign, Tough Ken Aman, it's kind of like him. His name is Ken. He's tough. He's a man. Tough Ken Aman. And for some reason, at the end of this story, he, he, uh, he thought that you know, the people named this town after me because I'm tough kid I'm on. And that's why the sign is there. And as a matter of fact, I have a picture of the sign that I can show uh, your viewers now and you. Which <laughs> I, you. So many years ago, had taken a picture with him. Um, one day I was driving by and he was in the car and I said, listen, we need to get out, Dad. He's like, why would we do that? I said, well, I want to take a picture of you holding me in a headlock <laughs> in front of this sign. And uh, because it's, it's a memorable uh, location. Yeah, and I showed him the sign, and he, he couldn't even pronounce the word. So he didn't know that red tough kid I'm on. So I told him, I said, Dad, we're in front of tough kid I'm on. This is the sign. And, and it just did dawn on him. That is a funny story. Now, the town, of course, is named after him, right? That's, yeah. <laughs> the, the story has evolved and was modified a number of times over 10 years. And, um, well, now he has the story. It's they named the town after him. At one time, I tried to tell him, like, Dad, that was an old Indian res uh, uh, reservoir, reservoir, uh, reservation, reservation. Yeah. And he was not buying that. And that was probably like six years ago. I tried to show him some uh, history of the place on the internet, and it just was not registering. He was no, no, no. They named the town after me. <laughs> and so, and it makes me wonder how many of our legends that are passed down through the oral traditions have been slightly tweaked that way through the generations. But let me ask you, Ken, how was your relationship with your dad growing up? My relationship with my father was, um, it was good. It was, uh, it could have been better. And, uh, but I don't believe there's any perfect relationship between a father and son. It's not an easy job for a parent to raise a child, and uh, I, I totally understand that these days. But my father was more of a dis disciplinarian. He was very fair. He was very stern, uh, but he was not super affectionate. He was not the type that would congratulate you. Um, 
So he was, he was a hard man, hardworking too, had a lot of pride, did things with a lot of integrity, and um, was very committed, very, a very committed, hardworking person. And I admire him for many of these, uh, these features and elements of who he is and was. Yeah. And can you say before his diagnosis with dementia, he began to behave differently than the way you just described him? And tell me and our viewers what you observed. Well, I have to say at this time, it was in his mid-50s, which was well before the diagnosis, that there was very, very subtle signs that he was starting to struggle with street names, people's names. I mean, these are things that he knew all his life. And for the first time, he was starting to struggle with uh, retaining this information in his brain. Well, when that started to happen, all of a sudden, the person who I remember being my father started to become, I guess you could say, soft a little bit and more human um, and started to show his concern. And all of a sudden, that man who I remember uh, being raised by, that sort of was so slowly taking a back seat and I was seeing a whole different side. And this was a more, uh, I guess, open person now. And he was reaching out to me and he was kind of like asking me questions about things and, and trying to learn with my help. And it was like, it was so flattering, it felt great. So um, it was a long time coming, but it came in, in this fashion, which is unfortunate. It, it is almost like, it was the gift of dementia, and yet it took some time for him to be diagnosed, right? Yes, it took, um, well, I'd say, it, when we start to notice the subtle signs, I'd say I'd give the number of 57 years of age. Uh, it wasn't until he turned 64 that he would be diagnosed with frontal temporal lobe dementia, which was 2014. And, and that's when you stepped up to caregiving after he was diagnosed and in what ways were you providing care for your father Ken? Well actually I started to do I guess take on the caregiving role uh, well before his diagnosis. Um, things that I would do with him basically whatever he wanted to do and things that would make sense and things that were simple and things that were very close to home. So, for in, uh, example, what we would do, we would go for walks with the dog. We would go to the local park, and we would walk maybe like a couple miles. And, um, you know, it was very simple. And then we would go in the woods. He loved walking in the woods through all the different trails. And he, he had this infatuation with it, which seemed to come on, come on all of a sudden um, with the unknown. When you're out in the wilderness, you don't know where that path is going to take you, uh, left, right, and all these hills. And it was just so magical to him. And I remember seeing this and I, I didn't totally understand it, but it got a little annoying too, because he didn't want to leave the woods. <laughs> so we would stay in the woods for a number of hours while he's searching around. And here we're only a couple miles from the house, but it, it seemed to him like as if we were in a whole nother uh, fantasy world. Or, yeah, a fairy tale. Yeah, it was very, uh, I don't know. I, I can't <laughs> even explain it, but I, I know what it was. Uh, I know what it is, and I know what it is now. And, and the big bad wolf was waiting in the woods for your dad, to use that analogy, sadly, uh, when he was diagnosed. And um, so tell us more about how that caregiving has been after diagnosis with you and your dad. Well, when I learned of what it was or what it is exactly that was uh, creating the changes in my father's behavior, I realized that, you know what, I have a, a, a major responsibility here now as a son and a caregiver. And I had to forget about everything that he and I had done in the past. I, I had no hardships. I had no, uh, I had no baggage. It was just now, okay, my father's in need and I, I got to step up to the plate. It's not about me. I, I can't be selfish. Life's too short. So, um, it was time to, to be there. And that's really, uh, you know, I, that's the only way I can put it. So, Ken, now that you get out with your dad, um, you shoot videos with him. And you've been doing this for over a year. And you post these to YouTube. Uh, tell us why you began shooting video videos. What gave you the idea? Let's just start with that. What gave you the idea to shoot these videos? Well, what actually prompted the thought was um, 
I want to say when, when he, my father had what it was, um, we put him in the uh, Veteran Senior Center. It's a Delaware Valley uh, Veteran Senior Center in Northeast Philadelphia. I had a hard time dealing with that because over the years as a caregiver and son and finally getting my father that, you know, a relationship, although it was under dementia and, and but it was now I had to give my father up, you know, and now we had to put him in a place and I was just looking at it from this perspective of this man worked so hard all his life. Now he's, he just retires and here he is in this place. And because of the pain that I felt so deeply, I felt, what can I do to, to help my situation, help me understand and scream or say to the world, look at me, look at my father. I want to celebrate my father. I want to celebrate what we're going through in this way. And I didn't want to be another person that just drops your, your loved one off in a senior center and then, okay, that's, that's it. It's all over. It's done. Now, this can is, this senior center actually, when we use senior center out here in California, we mean a place that elders go to visit, have some lunch, spend some time and socialize. But when you're using this in Pennsylvania, you're talking about a place where he lives now. And why don't we just backtrack for just a minute? And if you could say, what are some of the things that led up to you and your mom, who also was his primary caregiver, and actually both of you still play a primary role in his care, what made both of you decide that he needed to be placed in, in this place? Well, with frontal temporal lobe dementia, um, the uh, inability to comprehend and your repetitiveness and at times aggressiveness as far as uh, wanting to move forward and, and experiment and uh, investigate, which can be uh, can self-harm. You could easily hurt yourself in the process. Uh, well, there were some things going on in the house and outside of the house that was, it was very concerning to my mother and I. Um, for one, he would go to the burner in the, in the kitchen in the stove and he'd want to touch it. Of course, you have that uh, red gauge light that will let you know that it's still hot. You wouldn't understand that. Um, he would want to go next door and knock on the neighbor's window, go into their garage, uh, wander about out front. And, you know, it was a little bit scary at times. Um, and then he was going into the toilet in the house. And he thought in his mind, because he couldn't flush the toilet, uh, he would go in there and grab his own feces and then he would bring it into the kitchen put it in the kitchen trash can it was just a lot of things like that that was just inappropriate and plus a number of years was going on where he was following my mother around in the house non-stop asking her questions mm. and constantly it, singing and singing my mother would lock herself in her bedroom and she was going into a deep depression and when you have that going on for a number of years and it's daily 24 7 it yes. really beats on the caregiver so um Thank, you know, Ken, thank you for mentioning these three examples because people don't understand until they really hear that, especially the last one, which people will probably go, ew, as you guys would. But I mean, when your brain is not functioning normally, as we consider normally, these are natural things that occur and we need to feel greater compassion for our loved ones when they experience this level of confusion. So I, I want to ask, because here you are trying to live your life doing your work, and I believe you mentioned when we talked earlier that you work as a personal trainer, helping people be physically fit, and looking at you, you certainly are a model of that, so you would be a model inspiration as well as the training that you provide. So how did you balance, how did your mom balance how do you balance caregiving with the demands of your own life? I think for my mother and I, the, the benefit that we had, we had each other. And we were both in it, uh, chest deep. So we could relate to one another. And whenever she needed a break, I was there and vice versa. Um, the great thing, too, is um, there's a support system that we do have as well. Uh, we do have other family members, one in particular that lives next door, which is my brother, Sean, and his wife, Claire. And they would uh, ass uh, assist as well in certain areas when they could. But um, as far as with my mother and I, we really 
would bounce off bounce things off one another and it was a, a support system that we had that, which would help us get through some of the more trying times um, and my mother would every so often go to support groups and I would join her and that was really helpful I, I really liked and enjoy how we could open up and see there was other people that were going through something similar yes and that was very comforting you know and I, I appreciated that greatly that yeah. helped I was caring for my father with Alzheimer's. I considered my support group my family. They, that's what they become. Mm -hmm. As, uh, oftentimes our family moves away for whatever reason. They can't bear the reality. And so we find a family who has our back, who understands us, who understands what we're going through, who can laugh with us. And I'm glad to hear that you mentioned support group and that you attended. So I want to move on. Uh, to something because when I viewed your videos on YouTube and we'll share the link to this and, and I'll just mention it right now the YouTube uh, if you put a search go to youtube.com and then put in the journey with tough Kenna man 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 even though the town is pronounced uh, spelled m-o-n tough Kenna man but we'll put it in the description uh, below the YouTube video and the link but when I was watching these videos Ken I see your dad struggling with FTD frontal temporal lobe dementia as he tries to connect with the people around him and I watch deeply and those who also live with a loved one with dementia will see this and we need to help people who aren't yet caregiving or at the early stage of caregiving understand this your dad is looking for confirmation he's looking for affirmation in a way where all all of us in life whether we have dementia or not or uh we live as as i said not uh pwads as i like to call us you and me people without dementia so we try to connect as best we can and underneath it all, we can really see it in this particular video that I'm going to ask you about shortly. This need to connect. And if we can't connect with words, as your father tries in this particular video, the word you use, see, when you ask him, can you see what I'm telling you? Or can you see what I mean? And your dad holds on to the word see, and he takes his glasses off. And he says, I can see. Uh, so we try to connect emotionally, if we can't connect verbally, by looking deeply and find ways to connect. And yet, you show to all of us what it is and how it feels and how sometimes it's frustrating for a family member, a PWAD family member, person without dementia, to see a loved one not get it. So here's what I'm going to ask you about this poignant video that you share, and it's just like jo uh, Joey's of Molly's movement, where his mom stops recognizing him. But this one, your father reacts to the woman he hugs first hesitatingly, then tightly, and we can hear him say, "I've never stopped loving you." And as he holds her and they kiss, he looks, he kind of holds her away to look at her and he says, you're a beautiful lady. And then he asks you a question while you guys are sitting in the car. Do you remember what he asks you, Ken? Is that my wife? <clears throat> Tell me how you felt hearing him ask that. Um... <laughs> It's, uh, I don't know, it, I, it's, uh, I can't even put it in the words. I don't think I can, I, for the first time, I don't think I can really express what I'm feeling at that. Like, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm confused. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm everything, really. I'm devastated. I'm, I'm at a loss for words. Um, but at the same time, I'm like, it's a shocker. I'm always surprised with something new with, with this dementia, with my dad. And then when that happened, it's just, 
I thought I, I thought I saw it all. I thought I, I, I you know, what's going to shock me? And inside, deep down, at, at that moment, it was very like, man, this is real. Once again, I'm reminded that my dad has dementia, and you know, it's just going to get worse. And uh, I don't know. And that's not your father. That's the dementia, and that's a man, a hero who struggles so hard with making sense of his world with the remaining brain cells that are functioning with the synapses that he has that remain that try to tie his memories together looking for every minute piece of recognition in that video which we will also share that specific video link because it's so poignant mm -hmm. yeah so I ask you then, as we come to the end of this interview, what advice do you have for other caregivers since you've been doing this for a while as a primary caregiver, hands-on caregiver, let's say a co-primary hands-on caregiver, and now still an involved caregiver, what advice do you have for others who are finding themselves walking your path? Um, try not to be afraid and uh, try to go at it head on if you can, because it's like a cloud of smoke. If you do that, you'll come out and your vision will be that much clearer. And um, the pain that you uh, go through, and if you can withstand it, I'm telling you, uh, you will be so much stronger. Um, your patience will be incredible. You'll have a whole different perception on life and people, and uh, you'll just have this tremendous compassion that I don't think you'll ever be able to truly acquire just in everyday life. Um, that is until you experience an adversity like this, and it doesn't have to necessarily be dementia. But there is something beautiful that you can gain from this experience. I would hate to hear uh, that someone's running away from it and trying to just like sweep it under the carpet, so to speak, and thinking that it's going to go away because you're actually going to have to deal with it at some point in time. You'll be left with some kind of regret, I'm sure. You'll be feeling guilty. And that's one thing I fear the most, too, is I don't want to ever uh, have to bury my father with this guilt on my shoulders. I would not feel good for the rest of my uh, time here on this earth. That's not something I want to live life uh, battling with. It's bad enough that you have to battle with your parent uh, with dementia, but I don't want to now go to the grave knowing that I could have done a better job if uh, I just put a little bit more time in, and it's worth it. It is really, truly worth it. I, I'm a whole different human being now because of this experience. I'd rather get my father back with all of his marbles, so to speak, but this is what it is. Now I feel I need to make the best of it. I have to turn this negative into a positive, and I would suggest anyone that's listening to this, you need to do the same thing. It's for your benefit, for your loved one's benefit, and for your entire family's benefit. Ken, those are powerful words of advice, and I thank you so very much. We've been listening to Ken Keen Jr., who has served as the caregiver's voice this month. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. <laughs>